Okay, so I think we start now. I think we waited for a few minutes. We got a good list of participants. We're nearly full here. Um, so firstly, I think we'd like to welcome you all to the, um, to the next session of the FRCS um, webinars. So this is designed for the trainees who are taking the FRCS exam. Today we'll be talking about shoulders. Really excited for this evening. We got uh, myself, uh, Mike Walton and Andy Wright, uh, who are going to be our panelists. We are joined by Chris Lewis, who's the educational uh, secretary for BOTA and Trish Campbell, who's the president for BOTA. So it's really nice to have you here. Mike Hayton obviously has organized all, all these webinars and um, it, it's, it's been really nice that we can follow the hand, the elbow, and today with the shoulder. Uh, next week, a uh, quick reminder, we have the uh, bone tumor unit from Birmingham who's doing the webinar. Um, so um, firstly, you know, before we start, I think it's nice for us to thank you as trainees for all the hard work you put in during the COVID crisis. You guys have been really, really sacrificing all your training needs and uh, going out there to help the patients. So that's, that's really been very much appreciated. And the whole thought of running these webinars, the Sunday supper has been, is, is, is like a thank you to you guys, you know, for putting in so much work. Uh, apologies in advance for all the technical glitches. We are learning the system as we go along, as you can already see, you know, linking these accounts to YouTube and all that sort of stuff is, is new for us, but we, we're, we're trying, everything will be recorded. And you can always look back at things and um, we'll try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, the format to today, uh, for today, we have three talks. Uh, first will be Andy. Um, Andy will be talking about um, shoulder fractures. Uh, we'll have some question and answers. Uh, I'll be talking about rotator cuff. There'll be again some question and answers. And finally, we'll have Mike talking about um, uh, instability. And again, we'll have some question and answers. Um, in terms of the exam, I think the exam is run to the level of where you would want to be in terms of knowledge as a day one consultant. A lot of uh, things in the exam are asked to check whether you're safe to run the exam or not. And that's really, really what should come through. Um, one of the things, especially, especially for the shoulder, which we've seen over the years when we run the FRCS course at Writington is that people get really uh, hung up about name tests and named uh, descriptions and try and stay away from it. Of course, if you know a particular name test uh, during clinical examination or description of an injury, of course, use that. But be aware that every particular uh, consultant will have a different way of doing it. So don't get too focused on just that one way of doing it. Even the examiners will have variation in their own techniques. So that's, that's really the top tip. Uh, just so we know where we are in terms of uh, who's attending, uh, we're gonna launch this poll, see if this works. Can you uh, choose one of the answers uh, in these questions? Um, so, um, we'll just wait for this and then we'll go on to the talks. It just gives us a good idea of um, where we are in terms of who we're speaking to. Like I said, you know, this is a new medium for us. It is a lot of times when we do talks, we can see the audience members in the, in the, in the hall uh, here. Obviously, we can't see who we're talking to, so this will be really useful. So we're still waiting for some more responses. And I can see the hall is now full. We reached maximum capacity in terms of this webinar. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be recording all this. So it will, and we, you know, Len and Mike are working in the background, hopefully with the YouTube. And we'll, if we can't make it work, we'll have the recording anyway. So I think the poll is complete, a vast majority. I think you can probably see the answers. Um, as well, okay, a vast majority of people attending today are pre-exams less than two years away. And the second group seems to be pre-exams more than two years away. Um, and then we have some post-CCT, post-exam and some consultants. Um, again, looking at the experience with shoulders, 
you know, there seems to be a good mixture of people who not had the shoulder posting, some who had six months and have more than six months. So that's excellent, good. So we know, we know we're dealing with mostly senior trainees here with the degree of shoulder experience. Excellent, so end this poll. Um, right, and share the results. So you can, you can all see. Uh, who is in the audience. Excellent, right? Now what we can do is start, okay, starting uh, with Andy. Andy, you okay to start your talk with the screen sharing? Yeah. Start seeing everyone seeing that okay? Yeah, thanks Mike. Uh, so hi everyone, um, my name's Andy Wright. I'm going to be covering shoulder trauma today. Um, so, there we go. Um, so in 15 minutes, uh, this is my learning plan. So first we're going to uh, just review quickly those top tips I mentioned last week for anyone who tuned in for the elbow trauma section. So we'll just run through those again really quickly. We'll spend a bit of time on those high yield shoulder trauma cases, so those cases you're most likely to see. Uh, and slightly different to last week, uh, this time I think there's some really key papers that you need to know about and I'm going to cover those uh, and tell you the bits of those that, that you should be aware of. Uh, and then lastly, we'll just cover a couple of cases at the end. So top tips for the trauma viva. Firstly, uh, as I mentioned last week, remember to build into the viva. The first 30 seconds to a minute of that pass fail section about relatively straightforward questions, the examiner assessing whether you're a pass fail candidate before you're getting on to a more complex rally, more complex shots, and you can start displaying that knowledge you've built up over the weeks and months. Secondly, really important to keep sharing that thought process throughout the Viva. If there's silence, the examiner doesn't know what you're thinking, they, they don't uh, know what you're assessing, uh, and it's really important you practice with your study buddies before the exam to uh, work on verbalizing the whole time throughout it. And finally, don't forget that level. We've mentioned it a few times already tonight, but that's the level is of a day one consultant, that safe and reliable colleague, not going to be the professor of orthopedics. All right, so let's have a look at the high yield shoulder trauma cases. So I'm going to look at these three areas. I think are the key things you might get asked upon. So that's those clavicle fractures, proximal humerus, and those humeral shaft fractures, which may have a radial nerve palsy. I think those are the, the high yield areas. It's very unlikely you're going to get asked complex questions about scapular fractures or acromioclavicular joints. Mike's going to talk to you about shoulder dislocations and stability later, and Panita will talk to you about cuff. I think that's a really good overview of shoulder topics for the exam. So humeral shaft fractures. Uh, so uh, you see these x-rays and um, immediately think, um, well, I, I can manage this a number of ways, and the old adage, if you leave two ends of a humerus in a room, they're bound to unite, is, is very much true. So if you're more of a lower limb surgeon, you're thinking, well, I can treat this with a humeral brace and it'll be fine in six months. Or if you're more of an upper limb uh, uh, specialist, you might be thinking, I can manage this with open reduction internal fixation or a humeral nail. Fortunately, there's always one concern, isn't there? And that's the radial nerve. Um, the Holstein Lewis was the first to bring us to attention at this time of type of fracture pattern, this distal third, short oblique type uh, humeral shaft fracture in which the radial nerve might become en entrapped. And this was back in the 1960s. And actually this paper um, was only uh, seven uh, um, case reports brought together. So it wasn't a vast series of patients. And in fact, uh, a number of meta-analyses uh, much later on have shown that really this association isn't really borne out um, uh, in, in the cases we see every day. But nevertheless, the radial nerve is always that uh, thing we need to be thinking about. If there's a radial nerve palsy, how do I know if the, the nerves in the fracture side should I be um, opening this fracture up and exploring the nerve? So hopefully um, we'll, we'll address that today. Uh, you can see the QR code in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. If you um, use your camera phone for that, that hopefully take you to um, uh, the paper itself with the full reference. And that will be the case. Those QR codes will appear throughout the slides, so feel free to use those. 
So this is the Giannoudis paper, and this is really the, the classical paper you need to know for the exam in terms of radial nerve palsies with fracture, uh, humeral shaft fractures. So let's have a little look at this in more detail. So what it showed is there was um, a 12% prevalence of radial nerve injury associated with humeral shaft fractures. And then they went on to analyze uh, over a thousand radial nerve palsies and to give us more information. So there was a high association with middle and uh, middle distal third fractures. Transverse and spiral fractures are much more likely to cause a radial nerve injury than those oblique and comminuted fractures. And here's the most important thing. There was no significant difference in those patients treated expectantly versus those treated with uh, immediate exploration and fixation. So that's to say, if you see someone with a closed humeral shaft fracture with a radial nerve palsy, you can manage those patients safely in a brace, monitoring their radial nerve as, uh, uh, um, in the follow-up clinics, and they'll have the same outcome than if you went straight in and explored their radial nerve and fixed the humerus. So that's really important evidence to know there. Uh, the next thing that follows on from that is the, the um, amount of time you should be waiting for that radial nerve to recover. Now, if you're using a standard orthopedic unit of time, that's six weeks, you're going to be uh, intervening in a lot of patients who radial nerves would have recovered if you left it longer. Now, as you noticed in this paper, uh, wasn't able to come to a conclusion of the number of months to wait, but speaking to our nurse surgeon at Wrightington, C. Wyong, he suggests three months is the round the sort of time scale you need to be waiting before you consider uh, exploring that fracture, um, looking for radial nerve and fixing it. Uh, towards the end of the paper, you notice gives this uh, quite a nice overview, um, which gives you a really good pathway or foundation for the exam about how you might manage different injuries. Now it does get a little complex lower down, but, it, but those first three points are really essential. So is this a closed injury, an open injury, or part of a multiple injuries? Clearly, if it's an open injury or a, a patient with multiple injuries and a radial nerve palsy, you need to go on and explore that nerve and fix the fracture. However, if it's a closed injury, they're suggesting a period of observation and conservative management is, is the best way forward. I would add some caution lower down the field. So you may work in a hospital where uh, ultrasound of a fracture to, to see whether the radial nerve entrapped would not be possible, or you've never done that before. And I would caution against uh, saying things in the exam which you wouldn't routinely do, routinely do in your practice. So you can use this as a framework, but I, I wouldn't necessarily strip, stick rigidly to it. Okay, so let's move on to proximal humeral fractures. So um, any of you who've done upper limb uh, fracture clinics realise these make up uh, a, a large proportion of the clinic patients. The majority are elderly patients over 65 years, fractures are at the surgical neck, uh, and over half are displaced injuries. Now, these were originally classified by NEAR back in the 1970s, and uh, this is really a, a visually a very difficult classification system to get your head around. I think the important things to gather, th gather from this is that the, the various parts that can be fractured. So you can have a two-part fracture with the anatomical, uh, the anatomical neck or the surgical neck, so there's a head and shaft, separate fragments. And then you can have various three or four-part fractures when the tuberosity is involved as well. So a four-part fracture being the head, the greater and lesser tuberosity and the shaft. Uh, and I've left here on the right that classic examiner um, question about how do you define a part and that's if it's displaced greater than one centimeter or angulated greater than 45 degrees. Now, whilst, as I say, that's the classical description. Many of us in real life would just talk about those anatomical parts. So if, there's, if there are four parts fractured, you can, you can say that you wouldn't necessarily have to stick to that classical description. So this hurdle paper um, is one of the really important ones with proximal humeral fractures. And this is one that helps guide your operative management. This helps give you predictors for those fractures which may go on to AVN of the humeral head. And therefore you need to be looking to do a humeral head replacement type of procedure rather than a fixation. So let's, let's go through this in more detail. So you can see he's clearly learned from that near paper and added a lot more color and those, these classical Lego blocks, which makes it all the more memorable. Um, so if we concentrate with a picture in the middle first, those are our four parts, the red being the humeral head, the blue and yellow, the greater and lesser tuberosities, and the green, the shaft. Uh, 
and he's shown that around you can have 12 different configurations of fracture so with number one being where the head and tuberosities have broken away from the shaft and 12 when you've got four separate parts so head greater tuberosity lesser tuberosity and shaft as four separate parts uh, and the takeaway thing from this is that as you move around, as there's more parts, there's a greater chance of humeral head ischemia. He used his Photoshop again to add a couple more parts into this and looking at those head split fractures. So head splits can be of different variants and you can appreciate here on the, the left image where that's that free fragment of head, that V fragment of head, that's much more likely to have ischemic change than the one on the right where it's attached to the tuberosities and may still have vascular supply. The final two points from this paper, this one on the left, uh, which we'll start with first, uh, is talking about the degree of metaphyseal extension attached to the humeral head. So it's this area you can see me moving my mouse on. So uh, you can see on the left here, there's quite a large area of metaphyseal, metaphyseal extension compared to this one on the right, which is a much shorter area. And Hertel found that eight millimeters was around the crucial period. So if there was eight millimeters or less metaphyseal bone, you're much more likely to go on to uh, avascular necrosis of the humeral head. The image on the right here now talks about the medial hinge. So if the medial hinge is intact, there's going to be less soft tissue stripping, less likely for humeral head ischemia compared to the image on the right where that medial hinge is, is not intact any longer. So I've, I've raised a lot of points there. I'll just clarify all those back again. So Hertel's saying greater number of fragments. If there's a head split, which isn't attached to the tuberosities. If there's a uh, metaphyseal extension less than eight millimeters and that medial hinge isn't intact, these are all signs uh, that you are likely to have, or that there's a chance, a greater chance of humeral head ischemia. And these are all things you want to be discussing in a viva. If you're being shown a proximal humeral fracture, you can mention all these and whether you remember Hurtle or not, they're all important things to start discussing and the examiner sees you've got that high level of thinking. Now we can't finish talking about proximal humeral fractures without um, speaking a little about the, the PROFFER trial. Um, so this was in 2015, it was a UK based uh, study uh, and they had 250 patients with quite a, wage, a, a wide age range treated across the country. Um, the inclusion criteria, which is always really important to, to see is that the degree of displacement had to be sufficient for the treating surgeon to consider surgical intervention. I think consider is a really important word to uh, here to, to take away. The surgery they did was either fixation, so that's a, either a nail or a plate fixation or hemiarthroplasty, so reverse replacement wasn't considered. And the operative patients were given a sling for as long as required and, and three weeks was the suggested sort of time frame. Again here with the flames, this is the important takeaway point. The primary, their primary outcome measure of the Oxford shoulder score showed no difference at any time period, at any point for a two year time period. And they've done further analysis at five years and shown the same thing to be true. So uh, a lot of people are using this to say that they can treat all uh, proximal humeral fractures conservatively. Obviously would add a lot of caution to that because of that keyword consider. Uh, and obviously all fracture patterns and um, patient demographics are different, but it's, uh, it's another tool in our uh, armory for dealing with these fractures. Okay, so finally I'll look at clavicle fractures here. So we can split the clavicle into thirds um, and uh, as Allman did here, and this classification system always confused me a little. I don't know why they couldn't move medial to lateral one, two and three, but actually it does make sense when you look at the percentages of fractures involved. So the most common fracture we'd see is to the mid shaft of the clavicle. And so that's group one. The next mo most common is the lateral end. And so that's group two. And the rarest or um, most unlikely we see is the medial end. Uh, and this is, can be a guide for the exam as well, isn't it? So those rare medial uh, fractures uh, are kind of uncommon. There's not a lot to discuss. And I think they're really unlikely they'd ask you that in the exam. There's a whole heap to see about, say about that lateral end, and that's probably uh, you know an hour's talk in itself. Uh, so I'm not going to cover that today. But um, this near classification system, which shows where the fracture plane goes in relation to those coracoclavicular ligaments and the involvement of those ligaments in the fracture plane, is is really important to to assess whether that fracture is going going to go on to unite or not. So let's look a little further at those 
middle third uh, clavicle fractures. So uh, this is a little bit of a, um, a history really of how our treatment. So um, this paper in 2007 from the Canadian Trauma Society really made a lot of waves in terms of uh, in shoulder circles really. Um, what they did is they randomized 132 patients with displaced mid shaft fractures to either having an operation or being treated conservatively. And what they found was that those who had the surgery, had the plate fixation, were improved in terms of their patient and surgical outcome measures at every time point up to a year. Um, there was an earlier return to function and decreased rate of non union. So basically, they were saying that people did better with plate fixation even a year post-operatively compared to if you treat them conservatively. Now, um, following that, uh, a lot of people didn't agree with that and several other papers came along, both meta-analyses as well as further randomized control trials. Um, and these are in the last few years to 2017, 13, 18. Uh, and basically they've disproved that. So, so there is no, so if you take two patients, uh, if you take a patient a year who've had plate fixation or conservative treatment if their fractures healed there'll be no difference in their scores but what it has showed is that clearly there'll be a decreased rate of non-union with the plate fixation and so that's still the main principle when you're looking at those mid shaft clavicle fractures you want to be thinking is this fracture going to unite or not because if it unites we're fine if it doesn't unite those are going to be my symptomatic patients so two further papers that have looked into these non-unions and really just to uh, summarize them in one um, box, non-union is highly associated with uh, smokers, comminuted fractures, displaced fractures, and displaced fractures is on a linear scale, i.e. the more displaced it is, the more likely you are to have a non-union. We often hear people quoting the two centimeters, so is it shortened by two centimeters? And that's from a, a different paper, which was in the 1990s, and that two centimeters hasn't been reproduced. So I wouldn't fixate on a figure. I would just say that displacement is a factor, and the more displaced it is, the more risk of, of non-union. And then those patient factors about, um, about being female sex, sex and increasing age. So again, if you've been shown a, uh, middle third clavicle fracture in a viva, you need to be discussing about my concerns about whether this fracture is going into non union. And I'm uh, asking from the patient whether they're a smoker and I'm assessing the fracture for its comminution and degree of displacement. That's going to guide my management. So let's um, finally just look at a couple of cases. So these are the um, pictures I show, showed you initially from that humeral shaft fracture. So if we say this is a 68 year old female patient who's had a mechanical fall at home on a standing height. She's a type one diabetic and has had a recent stroke. It's a closed injury, but have the radial, a radial nerve palsy has been noted by the training and assessment. So you're assessing this in the trauma meeting the next day uh, and you can confidently say, well, from Giannoudis paper, I can manage this fracture conservatively. It's a closed injury. This is an elderly patient with significant comorbidities. I'm gonna manage them in a brace uh, and I'm gonna uh, review the radial nerve uh, in, my, in my clinic to assess its return to function. So um, if the examiner is being a bit sneaky, they might say, well, this is six weeks time. You can clearly see your brace has been applied. You've still got a displaced fracture and you've still got radial nerve palsy. Uh, how are you going to manage this? So if you remember what I said, uh, it, the nerve will not have recovered at six weeks. So you can confidently say, uh, I know the nerve won't have recovered at this week's. So I'm going to continue with my management strategy. I'm going to reassess the patient around the three month mark. If there's still a palsy at that point, then I'm going to discuss that case with a relevant nerve surgical colleague, or I'm going to explore that nerve myself and fix the fracture. Uh, and hopefully they'll go on to show you an x ray like this that shows it goes on to uh, heal with conservative management. The nerve function recovers fully. Final case to discuss. So, this is a 17 year old male patient who's fallen from a road bike at speed. He's fit and well, it's a closed injury and neurovascularly intact. So you can start talking about uh, your non-union fractures. So he's male, he's young, so these are in his favour. But this is a pretty displaced fracture and you can uh, clearly measure the angles or, or, or talk about the degree of displacement you might see. 
I'd argue there is some comminution here as well at the fracture sites, um, but the overall comminution isn't huge. Uh, so you want to then talk about your history. So I want to know, is the patient a smoker? Something I didn't discuss before, but clearly is important is what's the athletic state of this patient? Uh, are they a sportsman? What sort of sports are they uh, involved in? And what's their job involved? So clearly those occupational athletes, such as uh, electricians or plumbers, people um, builders, people are very physical, it's gonna incapacitate them for a long time. So as with most 17 year olds in Wigan, um, he's a academy rugby league player, um, and therefore it was more indicated to go on uh, and fix his fracture alongside the huge degree of displacement we saw on those initial x-rays. So finally to summarize, really important, you've thought about that humeral shaft radial nerve uh, injury in advance and you've got your answer in place. Otherwise you can easily be on the hop in the exam. Remember those hurdles risk factors for humeral head uh, AVN and then you can discuss those when seeing that proximal humeral fracture. And mid shaft clavicle fractures, non-union is the key for those. I mentioned some other factors about athletic ability and occupation, but you really that risk of non-union is what you're managing in those risk factors I've just shown uh, from those papers before are the key things you need to be addressing. Thanks very much, everyone. That's, uh, that's brilliant, Andy. Uh, Andy, we have a question from Atif Mahmood. He's asking, where do you start measuring the medial hinge from? So medial hinge is, is um, a binary thing. So either it's, it's intact or it isn't. So I think those pictures from Hertel's paper either show that the head's uh, collapsed down and the medial hinge, if this is medial uh, and this is lateral, either the medial hinge is in place. So the head should, was here and it's collapsed down or the medial hinge is not in, um, in contact and it's displaced. So it's a, it's a binary measure. Um, can I ask you a question, Andy? There's no more question from the audience. Oh, um, oh there's like a question from Andy. There you go. To, uh, <laughs> um, so that, that was a brilliant talk. Can I ask you, how has the proffer trial influenced your practice? So clearly, um, you know, it is a, a large, research database with a huge amount of randomization going on and really it's um, influenced those uh, perhaps older patients those patients at high risk of surgery but with quite a displaced fracture that you feel might warrant surgical intervention then you can be um, you you might be more inclined to discuss conservative management options with them uh, unfortunately, as I said, that reverse replacement not being part of the treatment strategy does sort of remove one of the common treatment strategies we might have for those more commuted displaced fractures in an older patient that you know are not going to do well with fixation. So it, there are things to take away, but, but you know, obviously some things were missing from that study, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So linked to that question, I think th there's two more questions now, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the question probably, well, um, linked to what you just said. What about Proffer 2? Um, are you looking forward to that study? <laughs> yeah, so uh, clearly that's going to, uh, you know, add a lot more. And, um, you know, with, like with any of these randomized studies, you, you really have to look at the question being asked, the treatment options at play, and, and, and um, you know, manage to take, that, take those outcomes to your own practice, which is always going to be individual. There's always going to be, your patient's always going to have different factors. Your fracture's always going to be slightly difficult, uh, different rather. And so you need to sort of uh, integrate those to your own practice as, as best you're able. Yeah, so that was a question from John Ammon. So we've got one more question from Sheriff. Uh, he's asking, how would you follow up for radial nerve recovery? So as I said, um, so we, uh, clearly you want to follow up the fracture. So you want to see that the fracture is not displacing more or becoming more symptomatic and the brace is holding things relatively aligned. Uh, and as I said, you won't be expecting radial nerve recovery before approximately the three month mark. And clearly proximal muscles will start first. So you're looking for that break of radialis function to return first before anything else. Um, any other questions from the panel? There's a couple of questions, Puneet, on the actual chat. Um, okay. What about greater tuberosity fractures? So, yeah, I mean, clearly there's a whole host of other proximal humeral fractures, which, you know, um, 
to discuss and, and um, I'm, I'm not sure the minutiae is something they're going to be assessing in the FRCS. It's that safe and reliable day one consultant they're looking at um, and we could discuss that with the minutiae in a sort of upper limb forum de definitely but, but I, I, I wouldn't so clearly greater tuberosity fracture is one that uh, can be treated surgically it's but it's there's patient and fracture factors involved. Yeah, I think it's important just to notice that it's it's attached to the rotator cuff and therefore behaves slightly differently. Um, and another one is if open humeral fracture with a radial nerve cut during exploration. So if you've done it yourself while you're exploring it, would you neuralize and mark it for later repair? Or would you just shout for CY from theatre? <laughs> um, so um, I... I uh, the BOAST guidelines have great um, uh, information on a, a range of topics and, and it's absolutely critical. You're, you're well versed with all the BOAST guidelines coming into the exam and part of those deal with neurovascular injuries. They're more at time of injury rather than um, a surgeon related, but, but I think they state that if you're not uh, capable to do or I don't have the skill set to do a nerve repair, then you should uh, gently oppose the nerve with coloured suture um, and then um, refer to a nerve surgical colleague um, but you obviously should go on and stabilize the, the humerus whilst you're there. Got a few more questions coming through Andy. Uh, so Zed is asking in displaced clavicle fractures other than the risk of non-union what functional outcomes do we need to discuss with the patients? Um, so union is key really and um, so if, if, if they don't unite you know, they may or may not have a symptomatic non-union and clearly if you're younger and more active, you're more likely to be symptomatic from a non-union, you would argue. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I think, still debate about malunion, about whether malunions are symptomatic and to what degree, um, still out there in the literature, but I think you're getting way down the line in terms of an FRCS examination if you're discussing the um, literature around malunions and how symptomatic they may be. Yeah, that's excellent. I think there seem to be one or two more questions related to the radial nerve injury. That, that is indeed quite a common question in the exam, isn't it? So here's one, any role of NCS in radial nerve injury follow-up? And a similar one related to that is what steps of management if the radial nerve palsy occurs after or if of humeral shaft management? I think you already answered that in a way, isn't it? So yeah. you could just give us a little bit of an um, overview. So we, I think... It, I think th three months is the time period and you'd be looking for clinical assessments of the radial nerve at that stage. And if you weren't seeing it, then you, um, uh, there's advice about the, the, if you look in the paper, there's advice about the, the nerve studies you should be assessing at that, at that point, mm -hmm. um, of which nerve conduction studies is one. Because some of our neurophysiologists are able to detect changes of nerve injury as soon as three to four weeks now, isn't it? Uh, as well uh, after after a nerve injury and I think you're right a uh, majority of them recover um, within a few months so um, I think the exam answer would perhaps be like you said just uh, wait and watch for a bit <laughs> um, right okay I think I think we answered all all questions great presentation and that was fantastic so I think we move on to the next um, next part of this session and it is, there we are. It is to do with the rotator cuff. So, um, so again, um, we'll go through what's relevant for the exams. Uh, rotator cuff itself is one of the commonest reasons why a patient would present to a shoulder surgeon in clinic. It is a massive topic. And we would usually hold a course which will run for a day or two just on this topic. So we'll try and summarize the key points for the exam in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, keep please sending the questions even during the talk via the Q&A section uh, in, in, on, your, on your screen. Uh, so that's where we are in the northwest of Manchester. Those who haven't visited Writington, when the lockdown opens, please, please feel free to join us either as trainees or in one of our courses. The rotator cuff itself is a beautiful layer of tendons covering the ball and socket glenohumeral joint. It has the subscapularis, which is the biggest muscle of all, the supraspinatus at the top, 
the infraspinatus, and teres minor posteriorly. So these four muscle tendon units comprise the rotator cuff. The function of the rotator cuff is a force modulator. So the vast majority of force of the shoulder is provided by these big muscles, the pectoralis major, lat dorsi, deltoid, and trapezius. And the rotator cuff is almost like the sail of a sailboat. So the wind provides the force which moves the boat, but the rotator cuff changes the direction. So you can't move the boat without the wind, obviously, and not a sailboat, but you can't get it in the right direction without the sail either. So that's the function of the rotator cuff key, force modulator. Okay. Um, if you look at the arm elevation kinetics, if you imagine the pull of the deltoid is purely, almost purely superior and a bit medial. Now, if you were to just have the deltoid trying to elevate the arm, all you would get is proximal migration of the humeral head. What the rotator cuff does, it centers the, glen, uh, the humerus onto the glenoid. So it almost provides a hinge for the deltoid. And on top of that, deltoid can then elevate the arm. So again, like I said, it's a force modulator. It changes the direction of the deltoid force and that's how you would get the arm elevation. You might be asked to draw diagrams of this nature in the exam. What goes wrong with the rotator cuff? It can either be because of extrinsic reasons or intrinsic reasons. So the, the story really started way back in the 60s and 70s where Charles Neer performed his experiments with the uh, acromium and the acromioplasty. And this beautiful paper, quite often uh, asked and quoted in the exam, this paper from Lou Bigliani in uh, New York, he looked at the shapes of the acromion and looked at the prevalence of cuff tears related to the different shaped acromions. So if you look at this um, diagram on the top left, uh, if the acromion is flat, there's a 17% prevalence of cuff tears in these shoulders and it becomes curved and hooked, the prevalence increases. So from that, it was felt that the acromion digs into the rotator cuff superiorly leading on to supraspinatus tears and that is that is the cause of the problem. So from then on, it came this theory that you, know, that you have external injury leading to microtrauma, leading on to partial thickness tears, full thickness tears, extension to massive tears and then cuff tear arthropathy. So this is a really simple mechanical external compression theory. Beautiful story to tell our patient. You got the spur, we'll take it out and you'll get better. However, what it, what it didn't explain is that why were we seeing more articular sided tears than bursal sided tears? If, if it was external compression, you'll clearly see bursal sided tears more often. Why would only some partial tears progress to full tears? We, we couldn't explain how only a small proportion of tears were progressing to cuff arthropathy. We couldn't explain how, you know, there's no difference whether you do acromioplasty or no acromioplasty after cuff repair, there's no difference. So a lot of, lot of problems with such a simple theory and hence comes along this really complicated picture. And on the left, you have these extrinsic factors, which is essentially trauma and impingement. And on the right, we have these intrinsic factors such as age, degeneration, crystal deposition, genetic reasons, and blood supply. And all these intrinsic and, intrins and extrinsic factors will then combine to cause rotator cuff dysfunction. So this is a more detailed, but very confusing and complicated model. So in simple words, you can say rotator cuff dysfunction is multifactorial. It's not a single reason. In terms of disease spectrum, you'll see starting off with edema, hemorrhage, going on to bursitis, tendinopathy, impingement, where the cuff is intact, going on to partial tears, full thickness tears, and cuff tears. And a very small proportion of people who actually start developing cuff pathology will actually go on to develop the full spectrum of cuff arthropathy. And that's important to reassure your patients, patients who start to develop impingement, impingement that they will not necessarily develop onto, go on to develop arthritis. Here's another nice paper to quote in the exam. Um, asymptomatic volunteers were asked to come and have an ultrasound scan. And it was found that the prevalence of cuff tears 
increases with increasing age. So in simple words, cuff tails is like getting gray hair. So on, in this study at least, uh, you can see above the age of 50, uh, sorry, above the age of 80, you can see over 50% people have cuff tails. Now there are, there are more studies like this showing increasing prevalence. In this, the rate is quite high and a lot of partial tears are also involved, but the gist of the paper is that you have an increasing incidence and prevalence of cuff tears with increasing age. When you wanna make a diagnosis of cuff uh, dysfunction, uh, one needs to look for uh, good history examinations, do some special tests and investigation. That's how you make a diagnosis. So a person with cuff problems with classically will, will present with pain in the deltoid area, which gets worse on elevations and rotations of the arm. Such pain in the neck and paraspinal area is, is usually cervical in origin, and pain described in the trapezial area here can either be from the neck or from the shoulder. So you gotta be careful when patients present with this location of pain. History is everything in, in medicine, especially in orthopedics, so so true for this problem. As I said earlier, there's a huge variety of tests described for shoulder pathologies, and this causes a huge amount of confusion. I would suggest that you learn one good way of testing each condition, depending on who you work with, and you learn from them, and stick to that. The examiners will know very well that there's a variation in the way the tests are performed, and you have for the impingement, you have the near sign, the Hawkins sign, for the subscapularis, it's nice to learn the Gerber's lift-off test, the Behug test, and the Napoleon belly press test. And you see how we're using cluster of tests. We're not just relying on one particular test to make a diagnosis. Supraspinatus and the empty can test is very popular. Uh, these are strength tests. So in infraspinatus, we're checking resisted external rotation. And for the TD spinal, for example, we're using the Pate test or the Hornblower sign. So learn these in your clinical postings, and when you come, for the, come up for the clinical courses, we can sh uh, show that to you in a bit more detail. But it's nice to have your own way of testing each, each of these muscles. What's important to say at this point is a positive test does not necessarily mean a, a particular diagnosis. In fact, a nice Cochrane review looked at multiple studies and looked at multiple tests and their combinations and found that the test was performed differently by different people in all these studies. And there was no clear evidence to support a particular test. So we go back to that original uh, saying that to make a diagnosis, you have to rely on a combination of history, examination, special tests, and investigations. For cuff investigations at an early stage, um, Oops, sorry, don't know what's happened there. I think we're having some fun with the, uh, with the IT side. Just one second. It just um, stopped working for some reason. Let's try again, sorry about that. Okay. So x-rays, um, for early cuff pathology, you'd start to see some uh, changes in the tuberosity, some sclerosis, and in advanced, um, oops, screen sharing is stopped as shared window is closed. I'm not so sure what's happening here. Technology, hey. <laughs> Need to put some more money in the meter, Puni. I know, looks like we're running out of time here. Let's try again. Right. Okay. No. Nope. 
it just keeps crashing. If anyone's got any questions, they want to put them onto the Q&A while Punita is thinking about those. Right, what I'll try and do is instead of uh, running it on slideshow, I might just try and run it as a, as this screen. Can everyone still see, yeah? Can you see, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just run on this rather than going on a, uh, on a, uh, on a, a live thing, on a play thing. So, okay, on the x-rays, you can still, you can see some uh, sclerosis in early cases and later on you can see arthritis and proximal migration. Ultrasound scan is the go-to investigation for uh, cuff syndrome. The advantage of that being um, it is easy to obtain, it's cheap, it's quick, and it's very useful, especially for assessing cuff repair within a year after, after surgery. It's very useful, you can perform investigations at the same time, along with interventions like guided injections. The MR scans come along a big way, uh, especially when you come, come to surgical treatment. You can not only make a diagnosis, but most importantly with an MR scan, you can see muscle wasting and fatty atrophy. So if you look at this picture on the right side, you see how on a normal parasagittal view, you can see the muscle completely covering the fossa, of the supraspinatus, subscap, and infraspinatus. Whereas the picture on the left side, you can see the muscle is wasted away. And you can see how the muscle fibers are now uh, substituted by fatty tissue. So fatty infiltration and wasting can be seen a lot better on the MR scan. You can even grade that with the, with the staging and that's got good prognostic value in terms of cuff repairs. Management of cuff dysfunction. Um, I think the initial management has to be analgesia, physiotherapy, and injections. Um, steroid injections are useful in cuff pathology, not because they help in the tendinopathy part, but, also, but because the bursa has shown to have some inflammatory mediators when biopsies were done. In fact, when someone has a steroid injection or anti-inflammatory tablets, it has been shown that these inflammatory mediators in the bursa does, they do reduce after those injections. So the indication for surgery for cuff dysfunction is failure of the first line of treatment. However, please be aware that acute cuff tears, traumatic cuff tears, there's a, it, they're likely to do better with surgical treatment. So there's still some research to be done on that, but most surgeons would prefer to operate early for traumatic cuff tears. Now, surgery from impingement really started with Charles Neer's work in 1972, and you know, subacromial decompression has become very, very popular. There's again a paper which came out a couple of years ago, the Seesaw trial, which you'll be asked about in the exam, where patients were randomized into three groups, arthroscopy only, that is sham surgery, uh, decompression versus no treatment, i.e. physiotherapy, and there was not much difference seen at two years. So clearly uh, this paper will be asked in the exam because it's very popular. At a similar time, there was another paper from Sweden which showed better outcomes following subacromial decompression. Okay, so you know, for every paper, you can find a counter argument. As far as cuff repair is concerned, uh, you can you can uh, you can see uh, over the years, arthroscopic cuff repair has become the standard of care, and now there's clear evidence that cuff repair, as such, done arthroscopic, the results are similar to open repair. So you might find some surgeons performing open cuff repair. You can't criticize them, but Equally, you cannot say that arthroscopic surgery is anywhere inferior to open surgery as far as cuff repair is concerned. So we reached, reached a position of equilibrium in those, evidence-wise. Um, cuff repair outcomes, I wouldn't go through the technique of repair. However, the outcomes, the biggest challenge we face 
is that retails is the biggest issue. The average retail rate after cuff repair is around 30%. And we find that the clinical outcomes are as good as in 90% of the cases, despite these retails. You'd find that the challenge of, of uh, these retails are often seen in older people with big tear sizes, tendon retraction, fatty infiltration, muscle atrophy, and smoking. So all these are related to the poor quality tissue you might find during surgery. So failure is no longer from poor quality of anchors or sutures, but is related to the cuff quality. Managing the challenging cuff, so where you have a massive cuff tear or irreparable tears or re-tears, these all form challenging cuffs. And there are a wide variety of options available for that. In the exam, you probably won't be asked about these, but it's good for you to have a broad idea of what it might be. It might be ranging from physiotherapy, nerve ablation, partial repair. And I'll mention a couple of options which have come up recently. One is a in-space balloon where an absorbable balloon is placed in the subacromial space. And that holds out the acromiohumeral distance in a temporary fashion for a few months while physiotherapy can work. This is currently under NICE guidance. And the second option is superior capsular reconstruction, where a tissue is used to bridge between the, as a, as a bridge between the superior aspect of the glenoid and the humeral head. And that's again under NICE guidance. Um, for a challenging cuff, the initial treatment is rehab. If the patient has arthritis and rehab doesn't work, one would consider reverse arthroplasty. If the patient's not fit, fit for a big surgery, one might consider a suprascapular nerve ablation or a balloon interposition in the local anesthetic. And for a young and active patient, you want to preserve the joint if there's no arthritis. And here you come talk about superior capsular reconstruction, uh, augmentation, and if all that fails, reverse is, is the final port of call, which is a very reliable option, but we want to avoid it in a young patient. Okay, so that's that. Um, so I'll stop sharing now because we had enough fun with this uh, keynote. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? I was trying to answer as many as I could by typing as we went along, Puneet. Okay. Um, I think probably one of the ones that's worthwhile talking about um, just briefly, so we can go to the next one, is, is ultrasound versus MRI scan, because that's one that people might get asked. Yeah, so ultrasound scan versus MRI scan. Ultrasound scan um, is, is, the, is a very good screening investigation. It is operator dependent. So the person who performs the ultrasound scan is the only person who can actually um, interpret the images. Uh, the advantage is, Obvious, it is available easily. The time to do one scan, an ultrasound scan, is a lot less than the time taken to do an MRI scan. The disadvantage of an ultrasound scan, again, is the advantage, uh, is this advantage which is it's operator dependent. So you need to know who's done the ultrasound scan to make it reliable. Um, the main advantage of an MR scan is it's cross-sectional, so you can see the muscle wasting, you can see the fatty infiltration. Uh, accessibility and cost is an issue. As a go-to primary screening investigation, an ultrasound scan will always be superior, but for surgical planning, most surgeons will perhaps go on for an MR scan. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of um, time, should we move on to my talk? And then at I the end, we'll probably, if we have time, we can talk about UCAF. I think that's a good idea. I think it's uh, with the technical issues, it's gone on a bit longer. So yeah, oh, yeah. let's start your talk, Mike. Okay, so we're, we are running out of time, but the talks have been excellent. And um, I hope you're all the attendees are getting something out of this. Um, this talk is about shoulder instability and with um, a focus on exams, you're very unlikely to get a shoulder dislocation in your exams because they're painful. Um, there's a very small possibility of seeing an atraumatically unstable patient, but again, this would be very rare. However, it does form quite a good discussion topic um, in a viva. And so 
The key to understand about the shoulder, and this has implications for both instability and all of the other um, pathologies, is that our shoulder is designed to throw, and it's the only joint in the body which, well, we're the only people that has a shoulder which can externally rotate. And by putting our arm in these positions of rotation, the anatomy of the shoulder has had to change. And it's changed in some ways to facilitate this movement, but that movement has left it very vulnerable. And so if you were to look at a quadruped, um, the first thing you notice is there's no clavicle. And so the, the scapula is able to point downwards. And that means that as it is loaded, it's always in compression. There's no rotation. It's designed to move forwards and backwards to have a powerful stride. But in a human, we, we have this clavicle, and it appears also in uh, bipedal apes. But humans are the worst, because we have a very, very long and very, very thin clavicle. And that clavicle is designed to push our scapula round back to the dorsum of our rib cage and make the glenoid point outwards. And by doing so, it facilitates external rotation. And that allows us to throw, and that allows us time on the plains of Africa to get away from the lions and to think about stuff. And that allowed further development. But that position, the shoulder is not designed to be in, and it's inherently unstable. And so the glenohumeral joint wants to come out of joint all the time. There is no structural support to enable it to stay in. It's by far the most commonly dislocated joint in the body. And by the nature of the abduction external rotation position, it's most commonly going to come out anteriorly. So this, whenever you're talking about stability, we use the term all the time in terms of fractures, in terms of joints, in terms of spines, in terms of all sorts of stuff. But actually, it's quite a difficult thing to, to define. And Punjabi and White defined it best in terms of the spine. And that's the ability of a structure to maintain its relationship and function under normal physiological load. And so in terms of the spine, that's the ability to stay one block on top of the others um, and in order to protect the spinal cord. In terms of the shoulder, it's its ability to stay in joint. Um, and with each different structure, you need to define how it maintains that stability. And that stability will be maintained by both static and dynamic factors. And so static factors are bones and ligaments. And in the glenohumeral joint, unlike any other joint in, the joint in the body, the radius of curvature of the humerus is three times greater than the radius of curvature of the glenoid, which is its socket. In every other joint, it's the other way around. And so we have no bony stability. So our only static factors come in the form of ligaments. And those ligaments are the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and their intervening hammock underneath the bottom of the shoulder. Now, the point about a ligament is in order to work, a ligament needs to be tight. And so if we go to the knee, and we look at the balance of the cruciate ligaments, you notice that they're isometric throughout the entire range. And this gives the principle of the four bar linkage. I know that it doesn't work exactly like this, but the principle of repair is that we just tighten the lig ligaments up and they will be tight throughout range. Again, the glenohumeral joint just doesn't behave like this. The only positions that these ligaments are tight in are the extremes of abduction external rotation for the anterior band, and the extreme of internal rotation adduction for the posterior band. And we spend less than 2% of our lives in those positions. And so for the vast majority of our life, the ligaments are slack. And so the glenohumeral joint for normal functional ranges of motion has no static restraint. And so to maintain the shoulder in its, put, in its joint, we have another mechanism. And that mechanism is the rotator cuff. And as Poonin already told us, it does two things. Firstly, it provides a counterbalance to the high torque maneuvering muscles, such as the latissimus, the deltoid and the pec major. And so it counteracts those muscles. The second thing it does is it holds the shoulder in joint du during normal functional activities. And it's best thought of as almost like a dynamic ligament. It's got a posterior band, which is the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and teres minor, and an anterior band, which is the subscapularis. And these two muscles push and pull, holding the shoulder and joint all the time that we're moving it. And they do so by providing a concavity compression effect, and they pull the shoulder into its joint. 
but they have to be balanced. And so for the front one to work, the back one's got to um, relax. And for the back one to work, the front one has to react. And we call that concentric and eccentric activation. But the difference between a static system and a dynamic system is that in a dynamic system, you have to control it. So for this system to work, there has to be proprioception of the shoulder to tell the brain where the shoulder is in space and the brain to control those muscle functions in order to hold the shoulder in joint. And so this is where the maintenance of stability for the shoulder changes in comparison to any other joint is that our brains have to make it work. And that's when everything starts to become more complicated. Oh. There we go. Okay, so there's lots of ways of describing it. Um, and there are classifications by Matson, which is the so-called Tubbs and Ambry. But this is by far the best one. And this is the Stanmore classification or the Stanmore triangle. And the Stanmore classification triangle defines instability of the shoulder into three broad areas. There is polar type one. This is by far the most common, 80 to 90% of all instability. And this is traumatic structural. This is your 18 year old rugby player who gets landed on by 20 stone of flanker and his shoulder comes out of joint. These are the guys that come to your fracture clinic, having had an acute traumatic episode requiring reduction in A&E. We then have polar type two, and this is your atraumatic structural lesions. And so this is when you have ligamentous laxity. We then have type three and type three is when the big muscles overpower the shoulder and the rotator cuff is no longer able to hold it in place and they pull the shoulder out of joint. And so we have on this side, a failure of our static restraints. A, li a ligament is either too loose or has been torn. On this side, we have a failure of dynamic control. So this is when our rotator cuff does not work properly to hold the shoulder and joint. The body then tries to use different muscles to substitute for the rotator cuff the latissimus or the pec major, and those muscles incorrectly and in, in out of sequence activate in order to make the whole problem worse. Okay? Static restraint is the realm of surgeons. We can, we can help static restraint, we can fix ligaments and we can tighten joints. Dynamic control is the realm of physiotherapists. We surgeons cannot, under any circumstances, change dynamic control. So unless that's sorted, we're fairly useless in shoulder instability. But fortunately, 18 to 90% of our problems are up here. So, a bit of light relief, everyone needs a good video. So this is traumatic structural shoulder instability. I'm not entirely sure if it's out the front or out the back but it's pretty painful. So in order to understand traumatic structural instability, you've got to understand the structures. And so we have a humerus and we have a glenoid. And around them, we have a labrum. And the labrum is a fibrocartilaginous ring that runs around the glenoid. It's best thought of as the insertion point of the ligaments. It does have a, a minor role in increasing the depth of the glenoid, but for all intents and purposes, it is just a circumferential attachment of the capsule. And so if you start thinking about capsule injuries as labral, te or labral tears as, as ligament injuries, they start to make more sense. And so the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament attaches to the glenoid via the labrum between three and five o'clock on the anterior border of the glenoid. If you come into this position and tear that ligament, you will pull off the labrum at its attachment. And we call that a bankart tear. If you sustain the same injury in this position and push the shoulder backwards, you will disrupt the insertion of the posterior band 
of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And we call that a reverse Bankart tear. If you tear the labrum at the top, we call that a superior label tear, although those are much less common and much more associated with overhead use. If you're a rugby player, you can rip the whole lot off, and we call that a pan label tear. But you'll notice that this area here between about one o'clock and three o'clock is usually preserved because that bit, A, isn't very important and B is highly variable. And so these tears normally start at three o'clock and come round to one o'clock. When you look at the overall proportions of these types of tears, the posterior ones have been greatly overlooked for a long period of time. But when we look at, looked at ours at Wrightington, um, at nearly 500 cases, we found that a huge number, particularly in rugby, are combination injuries involving both the anterior and posterior labrum. And these label injuries um, often extend, and it's very important to address the front and the back to try and make sure that you keep both sides of the hammock attached. You must also remember that a ligament, whilst it most commonly tears at the label attachment, can also tear at the other side. And we call that a Hegel lesion. And if you see here, on this side, you can see muscle fibers. This is the labrum, this is the humeral head. And what we find down here is the whole of the humeral attachment of the capsule has become detached. And so if we just fix this bit down here, we'll end up with our hammocks still being destabilized. And so we have to go and fix both sides. Okay, you can see I fixed the labrum down here to the glenoid and we've fixed the capsule back up to the humeral attachment. And we love our anacronyms in shoulder surgery, so that is a Hegel or humeral avulsion of a glenohumeral ligament. So how are we going to assess these? Well, the first thing is to have a long chat with your patient about their mechanism of injury. You will almost get all of your information from your history alone. Um, Len has spent a long time defining, particularly in rugby, the different types of injury that will lead to different types of label pathology. But in essence, if the patient has had their arm out to their side, then it's highly likely to be an anterior injury. If the patient has had their, their arm tucked into their body, i.e. if they're holding a rugby ball, then it's much more likely to be a posterior injury. You will get x-rays, okay? We always do. The x-rays will often um, just show a relocated shoulder, but if you're lucky enough to get the x-ray while it's dislocated, that will tell you your mechanism of injury. Um, this this x-ray on the side here um, remains a rare injury, but still the most missed one in A&E, and that's a posterior dislocation or light bulb sign. When they come to clinic, it's quite difficult to assess them because they're painful, and this is why they'll very seldom come into an exam, but you want to look for apprehension. And so there are three different um, terms which are often interchangeably used uh, by people, and those are instability, laxity, and apprehension. And so instability is a clinical sign, a, a clinical symptom, sorry, that a shoulder feels unstable when it's being used. Laxity is a joint which has increased translation or play within the ligaments. So that is a sign. Apprehension is a feeling of instability when the shoulder is placed in positions during clinical examination. And they are, so they are subtly different things. Everybody knows about the anterior test, and that's taking the shoulder into abduction external rotation, which we call the Joe's relocation sign. Um, but the posterior apprehension is much less well documented um, and we've, de we've defined it at Wrightington, um, either called the modified O'Brien's test or even the Wrightington posterior instability test, depending on which paper that you read. But that involves doing exactly the same principle, which instead of taking the arm into abduction external rotation, as you would do for Job's test, is you bring the arm into abduction internal rotation. The biggest difference with Posterior instability it usually leads to weakness as opposed to a feeling of um, a true apprehension. And so we can see here on the good side, this gentleman is able to completely resist um, an inferior pressure. Um, and I can't overcome him in that position. Yet on the other side with his posterior label tear, with one finger, I can easily drop his arm down. And it's because in that position the shoulder wants to dislocate posteriorly. And the subscapularis is deactivated because of the position of the arm. And he's got two choices. Let me dislocate his shoulder or just give up. And so we have this traditional drop arm sign where the shoulder gives way.
Once you've got your clinical assessment, you're likely to know which direction you think this gentleman's unstable in. Um, and you're likely to have a very good idea of what type of pathology you're gonna find. But we go ahead and define that purposefully so that you know what to expect if you ever came to surgery. Um, and we do that with an MR arthrogram. There has been recent advances in quality of MRI scans, particularly in high clarity three Tesla scanners, which mean that we may get away, get, get away without using arthrograms in the future, but it still remains the gold standard for capsular label pathology. The only caveat to that is if you have an acute injury in the first five days, the shoulder is still likely to have a significant hemarthrosis and that can act as your um, contrast medium. The other only corollary to that as well is if you are very concerned about acute bone loss, a CT scan will define that more readily for you. Um, MR arthrography, however, is not uh, entirely without fault. It's only accurate um, in between 70 and 80% of cases, and it is more accurate in defining isolated injuries than it is defining, com com defining combined injuries. Now, these paper, this is a paper that you're going to need to know about, and this is written by Mike Robinson from Edinburgh. And this is a particular um, uh, predictors of recurrent instability and predictors of failure. And then very clearly in this paper, he showed that um, the younger you are, and if you're a boy, you are much more likely to have recurrent instability than your older compatriots. And so if you look at this study, 86% of 15 year olds develop recurrent instability, and that fell steadily to less than a third of people at the age of 35. The other thing to notice is that females are 10 years behind males. And so here we go, we've got a 54% risk of recurrent instability in a 15 year old girl, and boys don't catch up until they're 26. Now, um, instability events in, young, in, in women are much less common due to the nature of competitive and contact sports, um, and so this does define a particular um, cohort. The other predictor of failure is bone loss, and that bone loss can either be on the glenoid, which we call a bony Bankart lesion, where a piece of bone is avulsed in conjunction with the ligament, or it can be a hill sachs lesion, which is an impaction fracture on the posterior aspect of the glenoid. Being able to quantify the amount of bone loss when it com is combined on both sides of the joint has always been a challenge, um, and many people have tried. The best concept is one called the glenoid track, which was developed by um, Itoi. And what they did is on the left here, you can see all these dots. And these, this is where the humerus engages with the anterior board rim of the glenoid in 0, 45 and 90 degrees. And that defines this area here on the humeral head, where in abduction external rotation, the humerus will touch the edge of the glenoid. And we call this the track, because if a hill sachs lesion is within the track, it will not engage. But if it drifts outside of the track, then it will engage um, and, and be more readily dislocated. And so it's a measure of size and it's an attempt to try and uh, quantify the reciprocal kissing lesions between the two aspects. Um, people have then gone into defining this in a much more calculating way, um, but they've not yet shown it to be a correlation to clinical outcomes. If you do have too much bone loss, then you need to try and address that with bone. And the kind of go-to operation that you can talk about is called the Latage procedure. And this is a coracoid transfer where we take the coracoid and screw it to the front of the glenoid. It comes, uh, it acts therefore as a bone block to increase the glenoid width, but it also takes with it the conjoint tendon. And that acts as a sling on the undersurface of the subscapularis. The last thing that the majority of people do is repair the capsule to give it this so-called triple blocking effect. And that's it in place. And you can see we've stuck it with two lag screws at the front. There are quite a number of different um, techniques and modifications to this, um, but um, it's best just to know that the, the important thing is that you achieve bony union. And if you can get that bone to heal to the front of the glenoid, your outcomes are likely to be better. 
So last thing that we will talk about briefly is atraumatic instability, because again, it's, it's um, a, a day's talk in its own right and is much better gift given by physiotherapists. But atraumatic instability is the bottom of the triangle when we have what we call the type two, three axis. And this is a failure of static restraint because the ligaments are lax, coupled with a failure of dynamic control and inappropriate muscle activation. The key thing to note, back as we taught, said before, is we as surgeons cannot affect dynamic control. So this must be sorted before you think about doing surgery. Surgery become, and in, in those cases where you have a specialist physiotherapy, 80% of all of these patients get by quite happily without any form of surgical intervention. If you are going to interfere surgically, okay, and over here we can see what one of these shoulders looks like, They've got a huge capacious capsule and we can see large volume spaces, both anterior um, and uh, but posterior and anterior superiorly, a large volume. And you can see that there's very little static restraint in the shoulder. And so our aim in these people is to tighten up the volume of their shoulder in order to hold it in place for a period of time to allow our physios to restore dynamic control better. Um, this is a team sport, atraumatic instability. It's not a, a thing that surgeons can manage on their own. Um, um, and it's very much, we share victory and share defeat. So in summary, understanding what causes instability and the static and dynamic factors are really important. And by having a good handle on that and they're able to talk around it, it's um, exactly the same principles that you would apply to any other joint in the body. Understanding the shoulder is different in the fact that it has dynamic control elements, um, which mean that the, it is much more of a physiotherapist, surgeon, um, MDT management rather than surgery alone. Thank you very much indeed. It was a brilliant talk, uh, Mike. Um, I can't see any questions on the, uh, the Q&A section. Um, too comprehensive. Uh, excellent, excellent as always. Um, right, I think uh, uh, we, we've had um, we had a re really good session. Before we finish off, um, it may be worth asking some questions, which you which will check um, how much of it went through. And also, um, these are questions which we prepared, which might be asked in your MCQ exams and also um, in, in, your, in your clinical exams. So we're gonna try this. Uh, so again, you know, as you realize, this is a new technology for us. And so let's see if we can make this work. So we're launching this poll. Um, we've got some questions related to the, um, to the talks today. Can you guys see, yeah? So you can start answering these questions. Um, that's question one. There are a couple of questions that have come up here that I'll talk through whilst they're doing the MCQs, Puneet. Um, neglected posterior dislocations management. Um, once a shoulder's been dislocated for a period of time, it inevitably involves a, um, a significant uh, soft tissue contracture. They're likely to require open reduction and then ad usually addressing uh, the direction of instability with, um, with bone. Um, particularly in a posterior dislocation, that's a reverse hill sacs lesion. And so an impaction fracture on the anterior glenoid. Um, they're very, very complicated and difficult things to manage. Um, shoulder instability severity score was described by Boileau et al. And that um, gives a guide largely to contact athletes who are more at risk of recurrence. Um, and then the last one here, the key difference between engaging, non-engaging, and on track versus off track. Well, the glenoid track is an attempt to try and define which ones will engage. So an off track glenoid lesion is an engaging hill sacs, whereas an on track uh, lesion is a theoretically a non-engaging lesion. However, Every single hill sacs must have engaged at some point because that's how you get the fracture. Right, any other questions? 
Yeah, okay. Um, uh, can everyone see the MCQs on the screen? Um, the poll? Can you, st um, I'm not sure if you can see all the questions. Yeah. Maybe you can start answering those questions and then we'll, we'll let it run for a few minutes. I can see some answers coming through. Are there any other questions while, that, while people are answering questions? I think the key thing when you're doing your, your exam is to have a really good handle on, um, on the rotator cuff, examination uh, of the cuff and looking for wasting. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. The commonest uh, scenario uh, which we see as surgeons is the rotator cuff, understanding how the cuff works, understanding the pathophysiology of why cuffs fail, understanding the limitation of surgical treatment is one of the hot topics. I think the UCUF trial and the Seesaw trial has been done recently in this country. That will be asked. We mentioned Seesaw trial, which was impingement surgery. Uh, versus sham surgery that's been big in the news so worth reading through that. Yukov trial was comparing open surgery versus arthroscopic surgery. Uh, not necessarily true randomized but patients were uh, but surgeons were allowed to choose the, uh, the treatment of choice whether open or arthroscopic and there's no difference between open and arthroscopic at two years using Oxford shoulder scores. That's again a good trial to have. Um, some key papers in the rotator cuff which will be asked will be uh, Lou Bigliani's acromial shape. You'll be asked about the scores that we use. So, you know, those are, those are common. And they're easy patients to get in the exam as well. Cuff pathology, they're retired patients. They can easily come, come for a clinical assessment and exam. Instability patients, they are usually younger patients and uh, a lot of them are working and it's hard to get them for the exam. So when, you, when you're talking about clinical scenarios, think about what kind of patients the exam center can recruit for you. Um, so here's another question while everyone's answering, let's, let's attempt to answer this. Uh, Atif's asking, what is the difference between SCR and augmentation? Is it different just between the material being used? So SCR is a technique described originally by a Japanese surgeon called Mihata. What he did was he changed the way the graft was used. So in irreparable cuff tears, uh, he used a graft. In his original series, it was facial lata, um, so autograft. And he used that to join or create a bridge between the superior aspect of the glenoid to the humeral head. So that is a completely different way of uh, dealing with these problems. Augmentation is when you've done a repair, you augmented it. So you put another material on top of it. Now the materials used can be different in both these, but the fundamental difference, uh, so SCR is bridging glenoid to the humerus. Bridging graft is where you repair the tendon to as much as possible and use the graft to bridge between the edge of the tendon and bone and augmentation is when you repair the tendon and you put another structure on top so as to almost to beef up the thickness of your repair so um, i think that's the key difference theoretically okay so i think we've got voting from most people so we'll end the poll now uh, let me see if i can go through the questions um, share results. So this is the, Andy, you want to take the, your, your sections first, the first three questions are yours. Yeah, sure. So, um, so whilst diabetes might be on your radar for, uh, fractures uniting, it's not been a proven risk factor, I don't think in any of the studies so far. Uh, Open um, is the key word in this. So if you've got an open humeral shaft fracture, radial nerve palsy, that needs to be explored every time. So don't be dissuaded by the patient or the comorbidities. I mean, clearly, if they're not fit for an anesthetic, that's a different reason. But um, if there's an open humeral shaft fracture, the radial nerve palsy, that absolutely must be explored. Uh, and then finally, uh, proximal humeral fractures. Um, so um, 
the right answer here was that they can be treated with a variety of options with good outcomes. Um, that was perhaps a little bit more naughty, that question, but I just wanted to get people away from the fact that uh, all fractures can be treated with a sling. Right. Uh, because actually I, I haven't mentioned fracture dislocations there, which, you know, are another set group of patients that require operative management. Yeah, that's a nice tricky question, Andy, there. <laughs> Uh, that's excellent. So next is um, three questions from me. It's 53 year old lady presenting with pain in her delta area for eight weeks. And what investigation? Uh, almost everyone's got it right. X-ray and ultrasound scan is, is a great investigation. An MR scan can substitute an X-ray plus ultrasound scan. The key point which we're trying to make is that the X-ray is good for bones. Ultrasound is good for the soft tissues. If you just do an ultrasound scan, you can potentially miss bony or joint pathology. So use a combination. MR arthrogram can pick up a cuff disease, yes, but it's usually unnecessary and it's usually reserved for people with instability problems, as Mike was saying. EMG and NCV studies are usually reserved for, um, for people with neurological conditions. Next uh, question is, 60 year old male presenting with asymptomatic cuff tear, three centimeter in width, minimal fatty atrophy. So the key, key word here is asymptomatic. If a person has no symptoms from a cuff tear, they are not to be advised surgery. Surgery has its own risks. So no symptoms equals to no treatment. So cuff tears, remember we looked at prevalence of cuff tears with increasing age. You will have a 60 year old with no symptoms do not operate, do not treat. Uh, next one, all of the following are factors are affecting the cuff healing except, um, and again, most people have got it right, severity of symptoms, absolutely right. All of the factors are, uh, are, are affecting the cuff healing. And then Mike, yours, next three. Yeah, so most people, well, two th three quarters of people have got this one. So um, the key here is a 15 year old gymnast um, three month history of shoulder instability, uh, so atraumatic. Uh, she's got ligamentous laxity, so that puts her into the two, three axis. But the difference between two and three is the poor scapular thoracic control um, and muscle um, imbalance. And so the more muscle imbalance that you get, the, the more it pushes you into the into three category. Um, it would be the the the, the kicker for three would start to see if you saw latissimus dorsi or pec major overactivity as well. Um, this one again, eight percent of people got it. Um, unfortunately, there isn't an inferior band of the middle glenohumeral humeral ligament, um, but there is an anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament. Um, last one here again, everyone's got it. Um, it is associated with age, but inversely. So the younger you are, the more likely you are to have recurrent instability. Okay, so I think uh, that that was excellent, um, great performance. Uh, hopefully, it was useful for everyone. Uh, Chris, Trish, have you got any any points to make? Anything you want to say? Hey, that uh, was really good. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, well, thanks, thanks, uh, Andy. Thanks, Mike. It's been it's been good. Uh, sorry about the technical hitches. Obviously, when you do these things, uh, these are all. Um, Little, little learning things for us as well, but hopefully it was useful for you all. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, almost everyone stayed in till, till late, so thanks. Uh, next week, don't forget, it's bone tumors with the bone, Birmingham bone tumor unit, so see you all next week. And please feedback. Uh, yeah, and yeah, feedback and the, all, and the recording will be sent to Bota, you know, um, next week, yeah. And um, I think we'll try and um, put the Zoom link. Um, I'll give that to Tricia um, straight after this, and then she'll uh, hopefully distribute it to all BOTA members. And then I will then somehow try and uh, upload it to our YouTube um, you know, um, uh, channel. I'm not sure why YouTube doesn't like us. Maybe uh, one of my colleagues did an operation on one of the YouTube key uh, account holders, and uh, they keep blocking us. I don't know. So we'll uh, we'll work on that for you. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a nice evening. Bye.